before we get into it, so I'm very familiar with who you are. I imagine a lot of my listeners are very familiar with who you are. But for those who are not, can you just give us like a very brief kind of bio of, you know, who you are and what you do in kind of your journey so far? Yeah, definitely. So my name is Don Felker. I've been, I'm a software developer, would be the best title uh, for me. I've been doing independent consulting and freelancing and all different kinds of stuff like that for over 15 years if you know full time if you count sure. the part time stuff it's you know over 20 actually i have been part of android development so i have background all over the place a lot of it is in mobile mm-hmm. uh, but i have before mobile i worked a lot in the web uh, and then when the first android device came out i was lucky enough to try to just fall into that and i've been working with android since the beginning and nice. I've written apps like Groupon, My Fitness Pal, uh, American Express, Aptive. I mean, there's over 100 apps that I've written. And uh, wrote a few books on Android. I have a podcast on Android development called Fragmented. Mm-hmm. I have done a bunch of training videos. I've got Kotlin training videos on YouTubes. Mm-hmm. Um, fairly active on Twitter and, and so forth. And just overall, just try to share my knowledge around software development. Uh, my main goal is to make people's lives easier. Mm-hmm. Uh, in regards to learning software and anything around freelancing as well, simply because I had to learn all those things myself and I didn't have anyone to show me those things. So if I can help someone out, at least one person, then my goal is accomplished. So, Okay, nice. Yeah, very good summary. So, so I want to get into the freelancing stuff, obviously. I always get yeah. asked a lot of questions about that as well. But before we get to that, um, that's super interesting that you, you want to help other people, right? So when, when did that thought kind of cross your mind and the reason i ask is because i speak Mm -hmm. so i do contract work right which i think is similar to freelancing in the us um but it gets a bit confusing here because when i say freelancing they think it's the traditional you know i go and find a client i build the whole thing all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. um but uh, so like i meet a lot of contractors and the people that i meet that are not contractors have so many questions because at least in the uk there's not really anybody talking about like how it works why is it different mm-hmm. from what you do so when did you decide and why did you decide that you wanted to do that because you could have just as easily been doing freelance stuff nobody knows who you are you're making your money like it makes no difference to you right so you're asking about um why i decided to help people or why i got into freelancing uh, why did you decide that you wanted to share your knowledge of freelancing yeah good question so early um prior to my dive into the software industry my background uh, was never in computers. I didn't grow up with a computer. Mm. In fact, I never touched a computer. Uh, I'm in my early 40s, but uh, I didn't touch a computer until I was in my early 20s. Like I didn't okay. even know how to turn it on. Uh, yeah. I had spent my teen years and younger life in the mountains of Northern California. Uh, I actually raced motocross for Suzuki. So uh, nice. I was a mechanic. I built cabinets. Like I, It was not a traditional software career. Uh, and when I found software, I was super intrigued by it, but I knew nobody who, mm-hmm. who was in software and I had mm-hmm. no one to ask questions. And so I had to just learn on the resources that I have. And so back in the day, this is you know, late nineties, early two thousands. There was no, mm-hmm. we didn't have stack overflow. YouTube wasn't a thing. There was a few online tutorial sites, but they were very, you know, sparse. Mm-hmm. And so I had to learn everything myself and it was a very, very frustrating experience. And I wrote about it in a blog post that I have called, uh, learning the program sucks. Okay. And the, the, the short summary of that is I would get my computer into a state that I didn't know how to fix it. Like I, maybe a menu item could be moved to the left a little bit, like just in mm-hmm. windows. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to get it back and I needed it back. So the only thing I knew how to do was to put in the reformat disk and I'd spend six hours reformatting my computer. I must have done that a hundred times. And so as I started to learn how to do things, I would just take notes and I thought, you know, I don't want anyone else. If I can help someone else not encounter these same problems, then, then I'll, uh, then I'll do that. And so as I started moving forward in my career, I found Jeff Atwood's blog, blog, excuse me. Uh, Scott Hanselman and a number of other blogs that were fairly active at the time. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lot from them and I thought, well, if they've got blogs, I can have a blog. Okay. And so I just started blogging at the time about everything that I had learned and it started getting a little bit of traction. It was never really popular, but it helped a fair number of people. And then I, I s- saw that you could do the same thing at speaking at conferences. Mm-hmm. 
And so I just volunteered to speak at, you know, small local user groups and meetups and then small regional conferences. And it kind of just grew from there. And then eventually YouTube came around and on online video. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to keep sharing what I knew because if I could just help that one person that was like me, you know, kind of moving up through the ranks and to not have to have that same level of pain that I had yeah. and frustration, then yeah. that was my main goal is like, you know, Hey, I'll put this out there. I'm not worried about someone taking my job because like I'm building software. I might've just solved sure. this one little weird, obscure thing over here yeah. uh, and I want to put it out there. So that was the main goal and still is the goal, which I'll still put out a random blog post about solving some random thing on my computer or DNS thing or something. Yeah. Just so if someone searches on Google, uh, the problem is solved for them. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Cause yeah, I, I was going through your blog today and it wasn't, so I've looked at your blog before, probably because I found articles that I was looking for. And then when mm -hmm. I was scrolling for it, it definitely wasn't what I expected to see because it wasn't like, oh, Don writes about, you know, just Android stuff. There was like a whole bunch of stuff on there that even the yeah. words, I didn't know. I didn't know what it was. So somebody looking for it is going to find it. I didn't get it. So, yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's uh, one of the con. That's also one of the things that can make you successful in freelancing that, you know, I know we'll talk about that, but mm -hmm successful in freelancing and just getting your name out there is just writing about these weird, obscure topics that, mm -hmm. you know, for example, I have one blog on earth about using something called LVH.me, which is a local loopback address thing for helping develop web apps. Sure. But it had a weird problem on my ISP and okay. I'm sure someone else is going to run into that problem. And so I'll sure. put it out there. It may not get traffic for two months, two years, but eventually yeah. a bunch of people are going to find it because they need it. Yeah. And yeah that's going to expose them to you and anything that you're doing. And it might be, Hey, looks like, Oh, Hey, Don also does mobile development. I do mobile too. Let me go see what else he's done. And you know, mm -hmm. the rabbit hole is then open. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Okay. So jumping into the freelancing stuff a bit. So like I said, I get asked about this a lot, right? And mm -hmm. if you Google, at least if you Google Android and freelancing, you're the name that's going to come up. But I, I would imagine for freelancing, in the software development space in general, I don't know that many people that talk about it and are as, um, what's the word, like seniority wise, as high up as you are. So mm -hmm. I want to dive into that. But first thing that I want to, I want to ask, and this is something that I get asked a lot and I have my own opinions on this, but I want to hear yours is that, so me doing contracting, I have a lot of, I have a lot of friends that are developers that are employed, right? They have a job, you know, it's fine. They, they, it's fine. That's that's how they would describe it. That's how yeah. I would describe it. You know, it doesn't excite them, but it pays the bills. And if I said to them, you know, you could be freelancing, why don't you think about freelancing? The number one pushback I get on that is, oh, if I stay here for two more years, I'll become a freelancer. Or, you know, I don't really know this other thing yet. So once I've learned that, I'll become a freelancer. So in your opinion and, and in your experience, is there a bar that you have to hit to be able to then say, okay, I'm ready to be fr be a freelancer? I think you need to know what you're, what you're doing. You need to have some type of specialty at least. Mm -hmm. So if it's going to be web, mobile, whatever you're doing, you need to have, you need sure. to be able to build an app. Like you can't come, well, I don't know. You, I want to say you can't come out of college and just become a freelancer. And I say that, but that's exactly what I did. So I can't sure. tell you to not do that. The thing is, is that what I knew back then is not how I should have built software. I, I sure. give a talk at Android Dev Summit a couple of years ago where I was young and immature and mm -hmm. inside of the code I had put, uh, it connected to a MySQL database. And when it mm -hmm. failed, I, in the catch statement, I basically printed out to the screen, oh, you know, bad word. Yeah, 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 yeah. And one day, and I forgot about that code and it was all over the place. One day the database went down and my client's website just had a bunch of cuss words all over the. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 And so th that was something I would have no, never do now. Now it's much more yeah. professional. So mm -hmm. is there a bar? Uh, yeah. You need to be able to build apps. I think that's sure. kind of the low end bar and you just can mm -hmm. kind of know what you're capable of. Mm -hmm. If someone were to come to me and say, Hey, can you come build me a, you know, software for a car stereo? Like that's mm -hmm. not my specialty. Like I, I don't know anything about that. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you need me to build you a Android app or a web app. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. So that, so that clears that question. And then the second kind of thing that I get asked a lot is kind of along the lines of how, not how do you become a freelancer? I guess 
like for you what what was the point that you decided you know i want to be because I, I and this is my assumption i could be wrong that there was some form of employment i was doing this for a while and then mm-hmm. i went straight into like i decided i'm going to do it for myself i want to find my own clients that kind of thing yeah that's a great question like when do you know like this is a something you want to try because it's mm-hmm. it's a different lifestyle it really is there's a lot of stress that's involved in it because there's not the every other friday the paycheck isn't deposited into your bank account right you have to chase the money a lot of the time your clients yeah. don't pay on time yeah it is different so how do i know that i wanted to do that i did have multiple full-time jobs and then one day i got another full-time job but this full-time mm-hmm. job was at a consultancy and mm-hmm. consultancy is based, you know, you're doing contract work, but you are a full-time, em- you're a full-time employed by a consulting company and yeah. they sell you out by the hour somewhere. So I still got a paycheck, yeah. but that opened my eyes to showing up at a client saying, all right, we have a very, you know, here's the constraints of the project. We need to have it done in two months mm-hmm. and then two or three months. And then boom, I was on to the next project. And all of a sudden I realized, wow, I really like that because Mm -hmm. what I would find at full-time employment is I'd be really pumped up when I started. I might even be pumped up for the first year, maybe two years. And then after that, I would just get really bored. I'm like, this is like not exciting work. I'm kind of bored here. Mm -hmm. But when I was a consultant uh, at at a consulting company, I was on a new project every two or three months. It was always something fresh. I met so many people. I learned yeah. so many new things. Now I might be the person that was brought in to build a mobile app or a web app. And at that point I could then build it. And then I'd learn something new about maybe the industry, maybe it was healthcare or real estate. And I would learn sure. something. So I'd be growing and learning is fun. And so I'd have a lot of fun. And then I'd make a bunch of new friends at this company and go somewhere new. And what I found is it gave me a sense of freedom, like autonomy, Mm -hmm. almost like I felt like in control of and happy and like always looking forward to what's next. Mm -hmm. And the point at which I realized maybe I can do this for myself is when I started blogging more about what I was doing. So sharing my knowledge, like I've always been doing. And then as I would learn something, I'm like, Oh, this is kind of cool. Let me just talk about this at the local user group or local meetups or conference. I would do that. And then people would just start approaching me face to face at the conference, maybe on email, follow up, Twitter. Hey Don, we have this exact problem you were talking about at the conference or on your blog post. Is this something you can come help us figure out? Sure. And I would so still consulting in a consulting company. I would go to my consulting lead and say, Hey, they need help. And sometimes we'd be able to close the deal. Other times we would not, mm-hmm. but that just kept happening more and more and more. And eventually I thought I'm like, wait, I wonder if these companies would be open to me just working directly with them. And so I had that conversation with one of them and I threw out a number, like an hourly number. I think at the time it was like my, it was like $90 an hour, which is like when I first started uh, for full time. I was like, oh, here's $90 an hour. And I was scared to death of throwing out this number. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, totally. When can you start? And I was just, I'm like, immediately I'm like, wow, I underbid myself. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) There was no arguing. Um, I was like, okay, well, how long is this? contract for and they're like oh we probably need you three to six months and then of course like you just run the numbers Mm full-time three to six months ninety dollars an hour do the math like you're like Mm -hmm. whoa that's a lot of money yeah and then i thought wow this is working for myself this is autonomy this is freedom these are the things that i value above anything else and also if i want to take off you know i'm making great money if i want to take off a week or two i can do that no one tells me Mm -hmm. i can't now of course i'm not going to take off time in the middle of a you know, big release. Sure. So it was at that moment where I realized this is something that's really interesting to me and uh, Mm -hmm. I want to pursue it. And so, uh, it was then when I decided to kind of make that leap to, to go to uh, a full-time, you know, freelancing, consulting, contracting. And Mm -hmm. I want to preface Mm -hmm. this. You mentioned this early. There is kind of a difference. People see it differently. I'll kind of use those terms synonymously because yeah. one person will say freelancing, but they're actually just doing a contract job. Other yeah, someone yeah. else will say, Hey, I'm contracting, which is probably the most appropriate term actually. Yeah. Contracting for one, from one contract to the next contract. And yeah. then someone will say I'm a consultant. And then the consultant has like this weird I'm just showing you I'm just showing up and waving yeah. a magic wand, telling you what you should do and shouldn't do and not yeah. do anything. Yeah. I've been hired for all three roles. 
and mm -hmm. I would put them all under the same bucket as contracting. Yet yeah. Most people, um, and the reason why I choose freelancing to talk about freelancing is because during my keyword research of mm -hmm. what was the most searched term for software professionals, it's freelancing. And what yeah. they really are doing is contracting. Yeah. But to actually get in front of these people, I need to talk about freelancing to teach them mm -hmm. about it. So. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. That's So I did the same thing. I use freelancing to describe myself where mm -hmm. I'm primarily contracting. Um, and it was only when I talked to people that don't do it, but they would ask me questions like, you know, how do you go and find clients? And then I realized that they're thinking that, you know, I'm going to meet up groups, I'm meeting people, I'm shaking hands, I'm trying to offer out my services, where really mm -hmm. I'm just getting hassled by recruiters and I just pick <laughs> and choose which one I want to do. It's like, it's a totally different yeah. thing from what people think it is. Um, but there's a couple of things there that you wanted, uh, that you said that I wanted to touch on, which is one, yeah. it, it seems like we're kind of aligned on why we do it. Because for me, it was like, I knew since I was like 16, I don't like working for people. Like, yeah. I just don't, I don't, I don't like, I have a manager. I don't like being told what time I have to get in, all of that kind of stuff. And as soon as I was doing contracting, like the first time, the first contract that I had, like a proper contract, I turned up to the office and I realized like nobody gets here till 10. I think I was there at about nine. Mm -hmm. And I was expecting people to get in at 10 and, you know, there's going to be someone shouting at them like, why were you not here early? People disappear. You don't know where they've gone. And then I realized like for the majority of jobs I've done, they don't care as long as the work, like no, nobody's there telling you what you have to do. They're just saying you, this is what I want. You go get it for me by Friday or mm -hmm. Thursday or whatever it is. And it's a totally different vibe. But there's also things that personally i don't find to be cons but there are cons to freelancing that depending oh, yeah. on how people are wired and how they look at stuff you know they would be like i don't want to do freelancing so in your opinion like what are some of the the downsides like you mentioned earlier you know checks never come on time which is also my experience but then also you have to you have to kind of approach your finances slightly differently like you can't have your pay like you can't have your rent due on monday and you get paid on friday because you might not get paid mm -hmm. on that friday and, yeah. But what would be some of the other cons that, that you, you see? Yeah. So I just want to elaborate on that first one. I don't want to, I don't want to sure. downplay that at all. That is by far my number one complaint uh, with mm -hmm. freelancing, consulting, contracting is getting paid. I, mm -hmm. yeah. like I said, 15 years, never, uh, I, on one hand, I can count the number of times I was paid on time mm -hmm. and we're talking 15 years and we're, yeah. it's, you know, at least two checks a month. So five mm -hmm. times in 15 years I've been paid on time. And so people yeah, are wondering, yeah, yeah. Like, what does that mean? That means every two weeks to 30 days, I am chasing money. And yeah. that doesn't mean like, I'm like begging for money. It means I'm calling my client, emailing my client being, Hey, uh, invoice was due three days ago. 30, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you know, net 30 means if I submit my invoice June 1st, they need to pay it by yeah. you know June 30th. Yeah. I'll be on the phone with them or whatever on July 1st or 2nd, but Hey, I didn't receive a check or whatever. And almost always like, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We're cutting it right now. Or, Oh, it's, it's already in the mail. And yeah, not to say that based on my experience, 80 to 90% of the time, that's a complete lie. Yeah. Uh, it's not in the mail. They just didn't yeah. cut it and expect, and this is really, this is something that can get really frustrating, especially with companies with a lot of money. Yeah. You know, they have the money it's just, yeah. they're not paying you. So that can get really yeah. frustrating. And like you said, you have to plan your finances differently. So you've got to be willing to know, like I could, the work that I'm going to do today, I might not get paid for six to eight weeks on if I have to collect mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. So you kind of have to build up this six to eight week buffer mm -hmm. of, you know, all right, now checks have been coming in for six to eight weeks or whatever. Okay. Now I can start looking at freelancing. So that's the number yeah. one thing is that the second thing is, um, finding consistent client work. You have to be, you have to understand your risk tolerance mm -hmm. if, and you have to understand and learn how to read people. This is a, a mm -hmm. sales psychology tactic. You're going to find out people like, Oh yeah, we have this new startup and we've got all this funding and we're about to close our series a and I'm like, all right, have you closed your series a? No, we haven't, but we're right there. We need to get yeah. started on it right now. Can you start next week? And it's just like, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have a lot of yeah. trust in that process. So it's yeah. knowing whether or not someone uh, is uh, legit, the, yeah, that's one of the big ones there is uh, being able to read those people. Uh, and then long is just kind of being long-term 
thought process about it and being very strategic about finding your clients uh, can be kind of a kind of a bummer. I like to find clients that are anywhere from three to six month contracts or longer. Mm -hmm. Hopefully Mm -hmm. I can extend those. Um, Mm -hmm. So finding those clients can be challenging. Now, if you're at a client for a couple of years, that can also put you at a downturn because no one's really seeing you out in the market, seeing that you're available. But you did mention recruiters. and, And in my opinion, recruiters are the secret weapon of contractors and freelancers. No one wants to yeah. admit it because no one likes recruiters because sure. they'll send you a COBOL resume, you know, a COBOL job. You're like, I'm not a COBOL developer, <laughs> yeah. but you just have to realize like that. They're just, they're bla- They're just blasting it out there. And yeah. when you need help finding an Android gig, a Ruby on rails gig, .NET gig, whatever, I have a huge plethora of email addresses in my inbox where if I need something, I'll just, open that up and just, I'll blast them. Hey folks out here's, you know, I'm yeah. coming up in the next week or two. Here's here's my latest resume. Here's what I'm looking for. You got anything out there? Here's my rates. Boom. Within a few days, I've got multiple interviews lined up. Um, mm-hmm. So it's going to be the, I'm going to go back to it. It's, it's getting paid. It is frustrating. Uh, finding consistent client work uh, is, can be frustrating. The other thing that can be uh, frustrating with it is just the stress level that goes along with it. You have to, you're responsible for your health insurance. You're responsible, at least in the United States, you're responsible for your dental insurance, your life insurance, your disability yep. insurance. You don't have a 401k. You don't have stock matching. You don't have a stock you know, plan. That's why your rates have to be higher because you mm-hmm. don't get all these perks. Uh, you don't have, and this is a big one too, you don't have paid vacation. Um, yeah. If you want to take a day off, like, you're not getting paid. Yeah. So you have to understand that when I would take a week off, I would have this underlying stress still kind of chipping away at me. I'm like, oh man, that's mm-hmm. like, I'm going to, I'll do it by natural. I'll run the numbers in my head. Like, all right, I yeah. am not making X amount of dollars. Okay. Am I going to be okay this month or did I save enough? And so it's just a, it's a big math and stress game, but if you can get mm-hmm. ahead of the ball enough and save properly, live well beyond your means, yeah, it can provide you a fantastic life. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I, I would agree with all of those points. Um, in, up to and including the you don't get paid on time. So at least in the UK here, depending on what, what kind of contract you get, usually it's if I start working on the first, and let's say there's thirty days in the month, I issue the invoice on the first of the next month, and then mm-hmm. there's thirty days before they yeah. have to pay it. So that's you, what you do. automatically that's two. Yeah. So automatically that's yep. two months. And, and my yep. favorite not being paid. And was recently, uh, I messaged someone on the day and I was like, oh, this hasn't been done yet. And they said, fine, we're going to pay it today. And then two days later, I was like, oh, it still hasn't come through yet. And they're like, oh, that's weird. You know, I I checked on the app. Oh, it says it failed on my bank account. I'll just send it again. And it's like, no, you forgot. You forgot or you just Mm -hmm. didn't do it, whatever it was. And it came through and it was fine. Um, But yeah, and then I was also going to say, in terms of how contracts work that you do. So for me, I take a contract and usually the way it works is, it's you're kind of in the business but you're not really in the business so for example i get a slack account i'm messaging Mm -hmm. people you know web developers other people on the team whatever there might be a couple of meetings and stuff like that so like yes i'm autonomous in how i do my work but if somebody schedules a meeting for 1 p.m i can't tell them i'm in the gym at 1 p.m you know can you do it for two i mean i could but realistically i can't do that every day so there's some sort of flexibility there so is that similar to how it works with you or, or is it different yeah, it's very similar. So if I have a client, okay. that I, I like to go to the gym at nine in the morning. Mm-hmm. If a client tells me, look, we have our stand up every day at nine in the morning. Well, mm-hmm. it looks like I'm changing my gym time. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so you do have to be a little bit more flexible uh, and that goes for, you know, multiple things. Sometimes there's, I have one client that their biggest release, uh, their biggest day of the year was new year's day. Uh, it was fitness okay. app. And so, I mean, everyone starts working out on the first day of the year. Yeah. So yeah. the, you know, the last month leading up to the first, like was crunch time all through the holiday. Mm-hmm. Like, we're in crunch time yeah. all the way to, to Christmas, everything. So for me, I had to, had to work then. And then we would release, be stable, the new, you know, the new year would roll around and then we'd yeah. fix a bunch of bugs if they came out and yeah. then we'd have like downtime February, March time. So sure. yeah, I think your flexibility definitely has to be up there and you can't, now you can't tell your client at some point like, "Hey, I'm I'm not going to be here at this meeting," yeah. which is also some of the benefits of freelancing. Like, "Hey, that's just not going to work for me. I'm not available during that yeah, time." Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a lot of this has to go into the negotiation and contracts and um, the understanding of 
what your ex- what the expectations are of that contract. Yeah. Do you expect me to be there from eight to five, mm-hmm. or do you expect me to just get the work done when yeah. I have time? Yeah. Because usually that's what I'll try to opt for because I have children, yeah. and I might need to leave it two. Like today, I got to leave it. 2 30 p.m. to go get my kids from camp like they yeah and i'll yeah. be gone for an hour and yeah. if they have a meeting there at that time I, I i can't take it i have to get these kids yeah 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 <laughs> but yeah. there's flexibility required yeah okay cool yeah i only ask because i know a lot of people listening and i think again it comes down to the using the word freelancer is they think that freelancing is i got this contract okay cool you know i work from 11 p.m till 3 a.m and I just, you know, smash out the code or I just go to coffee shops and I do work and I don't talk to anyone until it's delivered. And it, it's not generally like that. So I kind of just wanted yeah. to, to put that perception out there that that now is different. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, I think there are, well, I know there are contracts out there because I've had clients where I've contracted or freelance for that said, hey, yeah. we need this mobile app. And yeah. I was the only developer on the team and I had yeah. access to the back end code. And I would just check in with the founder, Be like, all right, cool. Yeah. Here's where we're at. Here's the status. Here's a new updated version. You can download, check it out. And it was very minimal talk. Yeah. And then other yeah. times when I'm on a much more larger team or I'm just like an yeah. individual contributor, those ones are much more collaborative. Like, Hey, I'm mm-hmm. going to issue a pull request. I need to get two people's approval. I need to get mm-hmm. your feedback. Like I need to hop into your daily standups. Yeah. Every contract's different. So you just have to kind of know what kind of contract you're getting into. And some people don't like the traditional contracting staff augmentation model where you're yeah, yeah, yeah. part of a team. They just want to be, I, I treat them like um, developer mercenaries. They want to just yeah. come in and just like attack a problem, yeah. leave me yeah. alone. I'm going to get it done and I'll give you the result and then I'm out. Yeah. Um, so you have to, you have to understand what you're like. If you want to have a long career that's fruitful in freelancing and contracting, you're going to have to be flexible. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to take different types of contracts and just kind of go with the flow. Yeah, that makes sense. And and I was going to say on that point, um, developer mercenaries, I used to think of myself, I used to use the word assassin. So I was like, I would be an assassin. I just come in, I'll do what you need me to do and I'll leave. Um, But one drawback of doing that and not working on collaborative teams is you only work the way that you work. And Mm -hmm. so you don't learn other, like if somebody comes in and says, build me this app, you choose the framework you like, you choose the libraries you like, you don't get that. You know, somebody's commenting on your code like, hey, why did you do this? Why didn't you do this? So there's definitely like, it's, it's fun. And it is, it, I guess it depends on kind of your lifestyle and what it is you want to do, but there's also drawbacks because you don't get that exposure to other stuff that you would, if you weren't, you know, a mercenary or an assassin. That's also another downfall that I'd like to to bring up too, is like, you don't have that, you can't learn. So that's a Mm. huge one. And I've fallen into this trap myself. I Mm. have developed applications, like you said, using the framework I like, using the libraries that I yeah, like. Yeah. I'll develop it because I know how to do it. I'm very quick at it. But then yeah. the problem is some new library and framework comes out and I'm not paid to learn on the job. I'm paid yeah. to deliver. And so the mm-hmm. learning has to happen outside of my building time. Mm-hmm. That can be a humongous downfall because I might build eight hours a day, but I still need to go learn this new framework and technology. Yeah. And my client's not going to pay me to learn that. They expect me as the contractor, freelancer, consultant, whatever they're doing, to be the one that knows it already, to show yeah. up and deliver yeah. and teach their team sometimes. So that can be a humongous, stressful point. And I've gotten into situations where I've built applications for a year or two for clients, come out the other side, and I'm like, wow, the framework or technology I'm working with has advanced so much that I'm out of date now. Like now yeah. I've spent two months relearning everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, so on that point, at what point do you feel like this? So so for example, right, Jetpack Compose has been out, what, two years, three years, something like that now. And I've only just started looking at it because no contract that I've worked on previously needed it. I knew there was going to be like, oh, you learn this stuff. And then, you know, version one comes out and you have to relearn stuff. Um, And also even now the contracts that I see come through, maybe one in 10 says nice to have Jetpack Compose. So yeah. it's still not a requirement, but at what point, because you are working for yourself and nobody's going to tell you, do you decide like this thing's out now, I need to start learning it. Like at what point do you realize you, or what point do you, do you start learning stuff? I guess is the question. Yeah, that's a good question. I've been part of multiple new technology initiatives at various different companies from web back in .NET days to Android multiple times. Yeah. And the same Thing happens and this is something that will just happen in software forever 
a new library comes out, it's in an alpha release stage, early release, yeah. canary, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It's so brittle that yeah. if you start learning it there, you, it'll give you the heads up because you'll understand everything by the time it's stable. Yeah. You'll know everything about it. So you'll be the expert. So that's a, a, the benefit of it. The downfall of it is learning it will be the most frustrating experience you'll ever have because yeah. everything you build will break on the next release. Yeah. And you'll spend hours fixing it, talking yes. to the developers, trying to figure out how it works. So for me, as someone who's you know, being paid to deliver, yeah. I have come to the realization that I'm not really going to touch anything until we get to like a release candidate stage. You know, mm -hmm. I might look at it, I might tinker with it, but I'm probably not going to build anything of any value with it until yeah. it's somewhat stable because I don't have a lot of time to waste on, you know, learning, relearning. If something mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. two months ago was valid, it's not going to be valid now. Like, that's wasted time for me. And if you look yeah. at it as a billable perspective, that's wasted money yeah. uh, that I could be making. So that's kind of my, my standard on when to learn them, but there's mm -hmm. so many things to learn. So how do you even know what to learn? Yeah. Jetpack Compose is a good one. I don't need to learn it. I can use XML views all day long, but yeah. as someone who, if I want to be in demand, yeah, I have to see where the industry's going and kind of keep my yes. eye on it, keep a pulse on where the industry's going. And I know it's going to Jetpack Compose. So for mm -hmm. me, what I have found is having some type of side project where I've, I'm working with the technology, I can implement it, helps me greatly. And I didn't have one of those for a while, uh, though I usually recommend you having a to-do app. The one I had is so out of date that I just didn't even update it. Sure. But recently, I had another one called um, Jumpstart uh, Android. It's a native app add-on for Rails SaaS apps. And on when I built that, I said, you know what, this time Compose is stable enough in my opinion that I'm gonna use that. So mm -hmm. that enabled me to actually build a functional application that people will end up using, using those new technologies. And at the same time, I was like, all right, well, I haven't used Hilt before, but I've used yeah. Dagger for years. Right. Like, all right, let me use Hilt, okay. I haven't used coroutines before. I'm gonna use sure. coroutines. So I just threw myself in there because I saw that well, RX Java's kind of going out. Not really many people are talking about using it. Coroutines yeah. being pushed. Same thing with, you know, everything else in, in Kotlin flows. And uh, so it's usually when release candidate, it's where the industry is going. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's stable enough for me not to waste a ton of time. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. That's kind of how I approach stuff as well, especially because I always find people are talking about stuff and then they don't understand. So new people come on a project, usually junior people, and mm -hmm. they'll be like, oh, like I had one project where the guy came in and everything's RX Java, and he's like, oh, we should use Kotlin Flow. And we were all like, no, because none of us know it, and it's still like yeah. very early stages. And then he went ahead and did Kotlin Flow anyways, and all over his pull request was just like, you need to change this, you need to change this. Because like, yeah. people think it's cool, but it's like it's not, it's not cool because the next developer that comes in will be more experienced than you, mm -hmm. but he also won't, or she also won't know Kotlin flow because it's not at that stage yet. So it's like, you mm -hmm. definitely have to balance it out. But for, um, for the people that are listening that we haven't yet turned them off of freelancing, it's a terrible thing to do and you're not going to get paid and all this kind of stuff. If they are thinking about freelancing, like what would be the recommended route that you go, you, you would recommend to kind of go into it? If you just want to, well, you've got to know that you really enjoy it. That's the number one thing. Mm -hmm that you enjoy working on projects. And so a stair step type of approach is probably going to be the best thing to, to get yourself into it. And what that really means is you're gonna have probably a full-time job still, and mm -hmm. you're like, all right, well, I'm interested in freelancing. First thing is you need to learn how to manage your client. You need to learn how to send invoices. You need to learn how to run your business, do your own marketing. Yep. It's, you know, blogging, whatever you're gonna do to get your name out there. Or if you're just gonna use recruiters, I mean, that does work too. Sure. Um, so find something that's gonna be part-time, something that's gonna be allow you to work 10 to 20 hours, maybe 25 hours a week, depends mm -hmm. on your outside work obligations, if you have family yeah. or not, and then deliver that. Now those contracts are gonna be a little bit more probably challenging to find, well, not challenging, it depends on the size of the company and where they're at, mm -hmm. uh, because you'll need to make sure that you manage those expectations of, hey, I need to be kind of basically autonomous and get this done yeah. when I can, uh, yeah. I'll be working you know, at nights or on, on the days. And if you need me at a random meeting at 11 in the morning, I might be able to make it, can't guarantee it. Yeah. That'll give you some good idea of like, all right, here's what's involved in, you know, 
getting that client. Here's what's involved in signing the contract. You're going to see <clears> that when people say, hey, they want to hire you, and then you throw them a contract, everything slows down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lawyers get involved, and people have to prove things, and it can take any, you know, depends on what company you're dealing with. I think the fastest contract I got signed was two weeks, mm -hmm. okay. uh, maybe less than that, but I've had ones take four months, six months. I mean, yeah. one for a university took eight months to get signed. So mm, yeah, you've got, you've got to understand that whole process. And once you kind of understand that process and you've got these things set up, do that a couple of times. See if you enjoy the process. If you do, then start bumping up your rates so that mm -hmm. they're, you know, it's lucrative enough for you to really consider like, all right, I want to do this full time. And then you need to have some type of nest egg saved up. Or yeah. so you can kind of get started. I usually recommend six months if you can uh, yeah. to have. And that means six months of of your living expenses saved up in the bank and then already have clients lined up. And then once you have a yeah. client lined up, I usually recommend trying to find a client that's going to get you at least three months uh, of contract time just so you yeah. can kind of get some time underneath you, uh, get some money saved up. And then if that's what you want to do you decide to move forward with that, then if it's a 40 hour a week contract, you can take that contract, give your notice, and then you're off, off to the races. <laughs> now you have to worry about insurance and everything like that, which we can talk about or you can read about, but uh, that's kind of the elevator approach. I mean, okay, cool. approach. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so I was gonna say, um, I will link the book in the show notes because I know you have a book that walks mm -hmm. you through all of this kind of stuff, and um, Florian uh, Walters highly recommends it. So. Um, I'm also going to highly recommend it. I haven't read it yet, but it's on my Kindle, so I'll get around to it at some point. Oh, thank you. Um, but I wanted to say, so on that on that kind of approach, so someone goes into freelancing, what are kind of the things to watch out for in terms of, so you mentioned contracts. Contracts is definitely a thing. I've never worked without a contract except for one time very recently where a friend came to me and they were like, oh, my friend has a project. He wants us both to work on it. He's a good guy, you know, They'll, this is what they're going to pay you just invoice him it's going to get paid and it's fine and then we worked for them we worked for this guy for the client that he has for two months something like that so we're invoicing him you know once a week and nothing's coming back and then he doesn't know what's happening and then he speaks to the client and the client's like oh yeah we've decided we're not going to pay you until the job's finished um, and we only have mm -hmm. this much money left to pay you which is less than what we've already invoiced him so I highly mm -hmm. recommend definitely have a contract um, but aside from that, what are the other kind of things to watch out for or things that they might not be familiar with coming from an employment background? Because you mentioned like essentially contracting is a business. So when you're an employer or when you're an employee, I should say, you work for a business. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Money ends up in your bank account. You do the work and then there's a mm -hmm. whole bunch more on top. So is there any other kind of pitfalls or things that you would recommend people look out for? Yeah. Well, one of the big ones is you got to make sure when you... You've got, I'll just put it simply, you've got to save money for taxes. Mm, That's yeah. a humongous one that this bites everybody initially. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm just going to use round numbers here. So let's say that you get paid $10,000 from a client. They send you a $10,000 yeah. check. You get that check, you're like, yes, this is amazing. Yes. Yeah. Or more. Maybe you get 20000 I don't know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of money. And, mm -hmm. you know, compared to what your regular paycheck is. Mm -hmm. And you put that in your bank account. Now you're like, I got 10 grand to do whatever. No, you don't. Yeah. Um, you've got like maybe 40% of that. I mean, 60% of it depends on where you're, what country you're in, but really sure. it's, yeah. you know, take 30 to 40% is taxes. Yeah. You've got to learn to just take that, maybe get another saving business savings account, whatever, and move it over there, which I did bring up business account. We'll talk about, yeah. you've got to get it out of there because you, you can't look at it as your money because yeah. when it comes tax time, and I've been bitten by this a few times. I mean, I've yeah. gotten a tax bill that was almost $100,000 once that like, mm. <laughs> made me second guess all my choices in life. <laughs> yeah. um, the When that tax bill comes around, you're just like, what? How much do I owe? And then you look at how much you made. You're like, oh, my yeah. God. Like, I, okay, this is my fault. I didn't save properly. Okay, I got to get myself mm. out of this hole. Mm. So that's, um, that's going to be the number one thing. The, the second thing is you have to make sure that you're planning accordingly for, you know, you're building the right amount. Mm -hmm. If you're not building high enough, you're not going to make it. Yeah. And a lot of um, things that people do wrong is they take their, 
what they're making in an hourly. They don't even know hourly. They'll say, hey, I'm getting paid $100,000 a year as a developer. Yeah. They'll, div they'll divide that by 2,080, which will basically give yeah. you how many, uh, your hourly rate that you make at your full-time job and say, look, if I make yeah. that or more, I'm going to live the same life. No, 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 no. That's not true because the employer actually pays for part of your taxes that you'll be responsible for. Yeah. They pay a humongous part of your, I mean, I'd probably say in the United States, 75 to 80, maybe 90% of your health insurance costs. Yeah. Uh, dental, all of your other benefits. So you need to build that in there. And so actually in one of the chapters of, uh, of that book um, that I have, which is the uh, freelancing tactics, mm -hmm. I talk about how to calculate the, um, your, your rate. Now it does come out a little high and you might need to start a little lower. That's fine. But when I explain why you need all those things, uh, it's very important because if you don't, you just simply won't make it. It'll yeah. feel like you're going to make it, but three, six months, a year in, you're like, I, I'm just, I'm not making enough. I don't know why I should be making enough. It's because yeah. there's a bunch of hidden costs you don't really know about. Uh, then the next one is you need to live under your means. Uh, I have a <laughs> friend of mine who got me into freelancing and consulting. This guy was a wizard at this. He could live off of nothing. Yeah. And he just stacked all of his money and uh, he's doing very, very well right now. And um, yeah. he'll probably be retired in a couple of years. And he's yeah. you know, early 40s. Just And he did it from consulting and freelancing. Yeah. Uh, but it's because he lived well under his means and saved all his money and invested properly. He didn't live all the way up to how much he was making. Mm -hmm. um, there's other insurance things you have to take into play as well, but those are going to probably be the big ones. Yeah, I, I would agree with both of those. Taxes is definitely something people don't think about. Um, I kind of forget to mention that because I've been doing it for so long that it's just normal for me. Like at the end of the year, X amount of money goes into this part and that's my tax money part and I don't have to worry <sighs> about it. But I, I know that a lot of people forget that one. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, live into your means. But for me, it's also the same thing. I literally have a spreadsheet. It's like, this is how much money I need to live every month and this is the mm -hmm. total that I need in a year. And then yeah. everything over that is just gravy. Because otherwise, yes, exactly. yeah, you, you, yeah, you get caught out. And, and to... to um, this idea of like a job security. And I kind of wanted to ask you about that as well, because I know that like, even from us talking about it, right, there's going to be people listening. That's like, well, it doesn't sound like it's a, a quote unquote safe bet. You know, you might not get paid, you know, you might not make enough What if you can't find clients, all that kind of stuff. And my argument's always been like an actual job is no more secure. And you only have to look recently, you know, people are getting laid off at Tesla, people are getting laid off at Coinbase, all these companies where, you know, mm -hmm. six months ago, they're all thinking these companies are going to do great. And we have a job for the next five, 10 years. Or yeah. whatever. So, so kind of where, what, what is, I guess, what is your thoughts on job security? And in terms of freelancing, is there anything above kind of living under your means and trying to build essentially as much as you can that you can do to kind of help make it more secure? Yeah, the job security thing is um, one of the reasons why I ended up working for myself. Mm -hmm. Very early in my career, I saw someone get laid off uh, for, you know, just downsizing. And luckily, I wasn't yeah. part of that. And then I just saw the company keep going. One day he was yeah. there, mm -hmm. the next day he wasn't. And I just thought to myself, like, wow, everybody here is expendable. Like yes. no one i'm like even me even though like i didn't get let go because they f what they did is they found me more valuable for whatever yeah. reason they did i don't know what it was but hey here i am and yeah. that was a huge eye-opening moment for me and i thought wow no one no one's safe and mm -hmm. all it takes is a weird economic downturn um it takes something to happen in your industry um so there's a few things here that you have to pay attention to is that you know if you're in a full-time position you have to look at your company and the company you're working for because yeah, it might be a startup with, you know, series A, series B, and you've got millions of dollars in the bank, but how much runway do you really have? Mm. And anytime I have spoken to or interviewed and I constantly interview at full-time companies just to evaluate them and mm -hmm. I'll ask them, you know, all right, you're, you're VC invested. And then I'll ask the founder or however up, higher up I'm getting in the interviews, how much runway do you have? And it's a question that they don't ever expect a developer to ask. Because I'm basically yeah. asking, like, how long is this company going to be alive if we don't get any more money? Yeah. And that, you know, you're either going to get 
honesty or lies and you'll know lies because they're kind of dancing around the topic yeah um, the, the lies that they don't answer the question like there's no number just like you know mm-hmm. kind of we're expecting this and this etc etc yeah. yeah we're expecting this but if you get someone's like oh we know right now our runway is you know two years and six months you're just like okay you've done the math okay cool yeah i know how long we have here if we continue on our current trajectory with yes, current, spend yeah. rate, current burn so that's a big one for me is knowing that and then also you know the industry that i'm in is it am i gonna you know am i in an industry or a company that is going to be able to survive the current economic conditions and that's something i take into consideration Mm -hmm. a lot also when i'm going to be taking on contracts or consulting right now things are getting kind of rough uh am i going to go take a client who is developing a comic book application Probably not. I love comic mm-hmm. books. I've worked in the comic industry for many years, actually. I'm very familiar with it. But to me, that's too risky because yeah. I don't see people spending their expendable income yeah. on comic book apps. Mm-hmm. Now, if you were to say, hey, uh, what about a food delivery service, You know, like a grocery delivery service? What about a financial company that's been around for 100 years? What about mm-hmm. um, you know, something... Heating, electric, uh, so, you know, on a basic necessity. Those things yeah. people need and are going to pay for healthcare. All yeah. these things are going to be around. Even if people are struggling, they're still going to buy them, but they're not going to yes. buy a comic book app. So I have to kind yeah. of evaluate that. Okay. I think I'm going off on a tangent here, so I apologize. No, if that's, um, so that's the, the, the other big one there. You asked another question. What was it? The second part of it? Oh, now you're asking me to remember. And, and no, I don't. Um, I asked what were the things that people would need to look out for and oh it's, it's, it's gone from my head if it comes back oh, I'll so, let you know. that is fine yes. this, this is why yeah. this is why I like editing because we're going to make it sound like a really smooth conversation no problem. <laughs> uh, yeah so it's it's going to be uh, those two and then the other one is just understanding again this is going to go back to like your risk tolerance like mm-hmm. How, you know, is this, how long is this contract? You know, what am I going to be building? Do I enjoy working at this company? Um, and Mm. then one of the other, this is a kind of a orthogonal thing that I think a lot of freelancers, consultants, contractors make the mistake of is taking on too much work Yes, because one, this is a very feast or famine industry, meaning that feast meanings you're going to get. 12 people approaching you for apps and you just don't have the time to take them yeah and you're like wow i can make all this money what if i just worked instead of 40 hours what if i work 60 hours yeah and i did 40 hours here and i did 20 hours somewhere else i can make all this extra money and i could save it yeah. for this investment whatever you'll just hit burnout really fast so you have to be really yeah. careful of that i've done this a number of times and realized mm-hmm. i can't take on you know two clients like if i have a mm-hmm. full-time client that's it if 40 hours are used up uh, at the end of the day i'm done yeah. Okay. Makes sense. I, I was going to say the most I've ever done contract wise is uh, three at once. Although Ooh. the third one being being the one that I didn't get paid for, so towards the end of that it was less, um, like less hours. But I I was going to say my advice because I've done it twice before where I've done two contracts and the first time was e- oops the first time was exactly what you said, which was like burnout. This is too much work because they mm-hmm. were both full time. They need the forty hours that they're paying for kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. But then the second time I did it was kind of staggered so i took on a client and when i got there i realized like i could do this gig 20 hours a week but they're paying me for 40 so i have another 20 hours and then luckily the second contract that i took was the same thing so it worked out fine um but there's definitely like you don't know if it's going to work out okay because you don't know what that contract's going to be like till you get in there so that's definitely yeah more than one contract is definitely not for the faint-hearted because yeah the money is great and everything that comes with it is probably not worth it so. yeah the one thing I was going to bring up that's also that you have to be aware of is that, that you encountered actually is the contract thing. If you have mm-hmm. someone who says, Hey, look, this is just gonna be a short thing. You know, it's a, you know, a month or two, it's blah, yeah. blah, blah. Uh, you know, we don't really need a contract. We should just kind of get it done. I don't ever do those. Like, yeah. even if it's just a simple agreement, I want something that if I don't get paid, I can bring to a lawyer and they can just send a nasty, I call it a nasty gram, you know, it's like a nasty email to, yeah. to their company to get paid. And yeah. you always think like, that's not going to happen to me. And I always thought that too. But yeah. thankfully I had enough foresight with, with a good lawyer friend of mine. He's like, no, you always need one. And mm-hmm. 
if someone's trying to get you to agree to it without a contract, that's a red flag. Like, nope, yeah. uh-uh, sorry, I, I, I won't do it. Even if it's just a very simple, you know, statement of work, yeah. you know, you need that. I have run into the situation where I was not, I had a contract that it was $35,000 worth of work or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Client didn't want to pay, um, wasn't paying, stopped replying to all my emails. Contract was over. It was done. They just weren't, weren't paying. I had to pay yeah. the subcontractors underneath me. So I'm out money already. Yeah. I luckily had that contract, got my lawyer involved. As soon as my lawyer got a hold of their legal department, guess what? Within three hours, we had their CFO on the phones, like, we'll get you paid. We don't want a legal battle. Like, cool. yeah. Contracts yeah. will save you. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I mean, that was also always my rule. The, the only reason I broke my rule is because it was a friend of a friend, and the yep. friend that I knew was like, oh, it will be fine. Um, but the, the problem you have in this situation is like, I have no contract, but I could write nasty letters to the friend of a friend, but it's not their fault. It's the company that they contracted with fault. So by mm-hmm. by the end of it, it's like there's nobody to talk to because if I approach the actual company, I have no contract with them. They don't even know who mm-hmm. I am because I'm subcontracted. So yeah, I, I would agree. Yep. If you don't have a contract, don't do the job. Like there's yeah, there's no way around it. That's the only thing that will save you. Even if you're not going to press charges and all that kind of stuff and like take it all the way, you don't have to because to your point, you know, one nasty letter is usually enough to get paid. So it is. Yeah. Once yeah. I get it's it, that's all it really is is that. They see an email from something, something Esquire or, you know, yeah. you know, law firm yeah. dot com. And they're like, whoa, what is this? Yeah. And they open it. It's like, oh, this person is represented. Yes. Oh, they're serious. Okay. Do we just want to pay this and get it out of our hair? Or do we want to, to battle it? Now, the only thing that you could have is if you're working with a startup that just has no money, like they might reply like, sure. sorry, we're yeah. out of money. Can't pay yeah. you. And you're like, then you're out of luck. Yeah. But then also t- to that point, if they could pay, if they could pay you, they will pay because they know that they're in the wrong. Mostly they're just mm-hmm. trying to try you. In the same reason that, you know, you work for a company that has, you know, millions and millions or billions of dollars and you send them an invoice for £10,000 or $10,000 and they won't pay it. There's no reason that they won't pay it. They have the money. They can press the button and it's done. But it's like this weird cat and mouse game where it's like, how long can we string you along before we have to give you the money? So, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was... I mean, I can talk about it now because it's been over 10 years, but when I was at Groupon, like that was a humongous mm. problem. Like getting paid really, from Groupon okay. was like really difficult. Yeah. That I would just get the run around from accountants and everything. And yeah, uh, oh my God, it's like eventually I had to get, a, I just started keeping a track of spreadsheet of all the contacts. Like, all right, this is a staff accountant. This is the controller. Right, this right, is right. the uh, Finally at the CFO's contact information. And then eventually okay. I had my own dedicated account rep that I could contact when things went wrong right. because mm-hmm. When you when you're not getting paid, one of the best things you can do is just be the squeaky wheel, be annoying, mm-hmm. uh, because eventually yeah. they're gonna be like, I don't want to deal with this person anymore. And then also yeah. have a stopping point too, which is a tip too, is if you're not getting paid, uh, and I've had to send this email a few times. Hey, I haven't been paid. This thing is six weeks past due. If I don't receive payment the next week, I'm gonna stop, you know, contracting until yeah. I receive payment. You yeah, know, don't want to, but please let me know how we can resolve the, the situation. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great tip. I've also done that before, like on a contract, I think it was last year, um, where I had a contract and they weren't paying. And I knew mm-hmm. that they were trying to get to the finish line before they paid for like milestone one. So I did the same thing. I was like, listen guys, I can't keep working for free. So if you don't pay me, then that's, that's that going to be, that's going to be it till you pay me. And then next day money's in the account. So yeah, Check yeah nice. there you go. Exactly. Um, all right, cool. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start to wrap it a little bit, but before I do, mm-hmm. I, I have a question um, which I like to ask everybody. And you've been in the industry for a very long time, so I'd be interested in your answer. Which is, um, what do you think separates an okay developer from a great developer? It's a great question. Soft skills mm-hmm. is going to be okay. what separates you. And uh, well, that's a two. Actually, I'm gonna give you two phases to this. Okay. Soft skills in general. That's just being able to talk to people and communicate and, you know, being able to converse and not just being introverted where a lot of developers are introverted. Uh, I would yeah. say I'm a extroverted introvert. So there's times when I'll be extroverted and then there's times I just need to retreat away and just recharge. Yeah. So yeah. there's that. So you need to be able to talk to people and communicate. The other thing is, which is probably the most important one in my opinion, or at least has been in my experience mm-hmm. is being able to think like a business. And this Mm -hmm. is one reason that I get hired a lot for freelancing contracting is because companies will say, Hey, 
we want to build this product and I will build it in a way that's professional, you know, best patterns and practices, so, so forth, but I'm going to be very pragmatic about it. Mm-hmm. Now, I might not build the entire application with some crazy clean architecture type of thing, but I'll set it up in a way that it can be if it needs to be. Mm-hmm. I'll think about and talk to the business owners. What do we need? Like, how agile do we need? When do you need this by? And be very pragmatic about building the solution for them because what I've learned, especially with smaller companies and startups, is that they don't know what they don't know yet. Everything's a test. Yeah. And yeah. as you're building something, you have to not be emotionally attached to your you know, your code, the thing that you built. There's been many times early in my career that I'd be devastated that we had to throw away this thing that I put so much time and effort into. And, and nowadays, like, I don't care. Like, all right, I yeah. just spent four months on building that. You want to throw it away? Hey, I've been paid. Cool. Whatever. Yeah. 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 And you know, I'll have a copy for my own use if I need to do something similar in the future, but being able to think like a business and talk to the business in, in their, in a way that they understand, not like, Hey, uh, we're going to build this with, you know, this clean architecture and the MVI pattern. Yeah. The business stakeholder doesn't care about any of that. Like they just yeah. don't care. They yeah. want to know, okay cool. Uh, we need to ship by then. It needs to have this feature. They got to be able to log in. We need a deep link. We need blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah. To me, I'm hearing, okay, I need a deep link. I need this. Okay. I need to make sure that I have a test that covers, you know, at least a login path that covers this. I need some CI mm-hmm. set up. I'm not going to sell them on that. I'm just going to go do it. Like that's just part yeah. of the product. Now yeah. I may not build a humongous, crazy architecture. I'm not going to be a super artisanal craftsman software developer for the first version. Mm-hmm. for that product, for that, for that client. Now, on mm-hmm. the flip side, if I'm dealing with a big established company and they've got a team, being able to talk like the business is talking to the product owner at that point because that's who I'm going to be yeah. interfacing with. Like, okay, yeah. what do we need to build? Okay, I'm going to follow your patterns and practices that you guys are building or maybe if you need me to teach you how to do something, I can do that too. Yeah. But being able to help them accomplish their business goals of what they want to accomplish. Sometimes it's shipping mm-hmm. faster. Sometimes it's improving code quality. Sometimes it's improving stability. Sometimes it's something completely different. And mm-hmm. often, I mean, there's been a couple of times where clients have said, here's what we want to build. We need an app that does this, this, and this. And then I talk to the client, I'm like, we don't need to, like, we don't need to build this in like native Android. Like this is mm-hmm. basically a flutter app. Yeah. Like we, you don't know what you don't know yet. Like we should just build this once the flutter. And then if it works and it takes off and you guys make money, cool. We'll come back and fix that later, but we don't even yeah. know if it's going to work. And the same thing goes for, you know, I was at a, um, a Google developer experts event in Toronto a few years ago and mm-hmm. me and a couple other, uh, GDEs were sitting down with a bunch of startups and they wanted to ask us questions about their apps. And I think we met with seven or eight groups that day. At least half of them, and this is going to sound crazy coming from a native Android developer, half of them, we all agreed that they shouldn't be building apps. We're like, mm-hmm. this should just be a, a mobile progressive web app. Like, yeah. you don't need an app for that. Like, yeah. You're going to save time and money. Just build a website, get people using it, get people paying for it, yeah. and uh, you know, you're going to be off. So that's long answer to question one. The question two, how to be, you know, not be so you know, reliant on the kind of finickiness of the freelancing industry, Mm -hmm. uh, you have to make sure a, that you're putting yourself out there. And that means always being out in front of people in one way or another. Maybe your thing Mm -hmm. is writing. So maybe Twitter is your thing. Maybe blogging is your thing. Maybe you're good on video. So maybe that's going to be YouTube, Instagram, you know, TikTok, whatever. There's a lot of folks out there that have done very well for themselves through these platforms and are now people are constantly approaching them for a lot of work. But still, that doesn't, you know, that's still freelancing. For me, what I have found is then selling additional products on the side, which mm-hmm. help facilitate something else. Now, that's going to be my Jumpstart Android thing, which is a paid product. It's going to be books or ebooks. That's going to be software as a service. Maybe I've realized, hey, a lot of my clients are having this type of problem. Mm-hmm. What if I just built some service to kind of solve that and charge them a monthly fee? So, yeah. What that means is having multiple streams of income and then also mm-hmm. kind of looking at what's your long-term goal in life. Is it to be a freelancer all your life? My goal is not to be a freelancer all my life. Freelancing yeah. is a means to an end. For me, I don't want to work in software all my life. I'm sure mm-hmm. I will. I will love to tinker in it. I have a lot of fun. But 
I want to be able to wake up one day and be like, you know what? I don't feel like doing anything today. I'm going to go to the beach and go surfing today. Yeah. And I want to be able to do that and not worry about, is this bill going to get paid? Is that client going to get that mad? So I'm making investments into the future that hopefully provide me dividends that mm -hmm. will then pay me. So everyone's different of how you want to accomplish that. Um, yeah. But that's my way is, you know, multiple streams of income. One's going to be usually the nest egg. That's going to be my freelancing and consulting. But the mm -hmm. other one's augment it so I can help accomplish other goals in life that I want to get to faster. Okay. All right. That that all um, makes sense. A very good answer on the developer point because a lot of people, most most people say soft skills, um, but most people don't mention the fact that it's a huge plus if you can talk to the business in a <laughs> way that they understand what you're saying because then often yeah. you become that conduit. And then that's how you get more work because they don't remember that they worked with six other developers. They remember that they worked with you because you were the one that they were talking to the most. So, Yeah, there's the thing, there was like a, a I know we're wrapping up here, but I'll give this one last little anecdote yeah. of, of that. I was, uh, I think I had eight or nine years experience at this time. I was very into patterns and practices. I was doing .NET development. Mm -hmm. I show up at a client where it's an insurance company uh, to make, to add one drop down item to a drop down list took yeah. me eight hours, like yeah. one item to a drop down. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. And okay. I was blown away and I went and looked through all the code and I, was, I met with the architects of the system, it was five of them. And I gave a presentation. I said, look, this app just needs to be rewritten. Like you can't change anything. It takes forever. Like this is terrible. Yeah. Like you got to rewrite this. And one of the architects just like calmly looked at me and just says, we understand. Like, it's very difficult. It's hard. Like, it's not perfect. It's, it's broken. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they looked at us and like, but we're not going to rewrite it. And I'm like, well, why not? And, like, and they looked at me and said, this piece of software right here generates $5 million a month. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he goes, so that piece of junk, he goes, is insanely valuable. He goes, yeah. so we have to slowly learn how to migrate from what we have into something better. Yeah. And that to me, like set off, like it just changed my career. It's like, oh, whoa, like we can have this huge spaghetti code pile of garbage yeah. be insanely useful. And now that it's generating so much money, they have the ability to kind of slow down and break it apart. Now it doesn't mean mm -hmm. create things that are terrible, but it just means, hey, also understand that like businesses run a certain way, certain yeah. software is built a certain way and certain decisions were made early on to get the business to that point. And now they're like, okay, we need to come back and fix that. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. And and I have a similar story. So I think it was 2010. Um, so when I was in, when I was in school, my first exposure mm -hmm. to com like computing was um, VB, like Visual Basic, yeah, super old. And at the time when I was learning it, right, super old programming language. So I'm learning it in like 2005, 2006 or something, right? It's not new. It's just to learn the basics of programming. Fast yeah. forward to the first like real job I had, 2010, I think it was. I'm working on a VB6 program for a oh, government yeah. agency, right? And it's the mm -hmm. exact same thing. It's like, this thing is trash. It takes forever to work. It, take, it took me like a week to figure out what a bug was. And mostly because mm -hmm. nobody was doing VB6. So I basically just had to mm -hmm. Google bits of the code. What does this do? What does this do? But it was the same thing. Yeah. It's like they're not, they've paid so much money for it. It does what they want. They're not going to change it. So yeah, there's definitely a different approach to all of these sorts of things. But um, so just in closing, um, I hope hopefully everyone that's listening has got a very good idea about freelancing and I'm going to direct them to your book. Um, and I know you've got a bunch of stuff on YouTube and I follow you on Twitter. I agree. I, I think everybody that's listening should follow you on Twitter um, especially if they're Android developers, but for you, where would you like to direct people to, um, you know, what is your Twitter handle, all, all that good stuff? Yeah. So you can find me online, uh, just my full name everywhere. It's just, it's Don Felker. The, my first name, Don has two N's in it. Mm -hmm. So Twitter's just Don Felker there, Instagram, Don Felker, you, same thing on uh, donfelker.com is my website and you can find the Twitter, you can find Instagram, YouTube channel from there. Uh, if you're interested in YouTube content, which I have a, a very long Kotlin uh, course, if you're starting to learn Kotlin for whatever reason, or mm -hmm. you want to get a bunch of the freelancing content I release there too, uh, those URLs are really weird. So you can just go to donfelker.com slash YouTube and it will just redirect yeah. you right to the channel. And uh, nice. that'd probably be the easiest way. Cool. All right, perfect. Um, so that's everything for me. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask? 
No, I think we talked about a ton of great stuff around freelancing. Um, I do have a question for you. What would you say sure. is the most challenging part of freelancing for you? Or you know, contracting, uh, whatever. Question. Um, I think... That's a pretty good question. I don't know. I think for me, it's probably around like, like choosing contracts and knowing mm -hmm. which ones to take and not take mostly because, so I always have been like, if I can get a three month contract, I want a three month contract because if mm -hmm. I hate that job, if I hate that app, whatever it is, three months, I'm done. I still get paid. I yeah. go do something else. Um, so it's definitely trying to figure out if I'm going to enjoy what it is I'm getting into. Because I don't want to be on a six month contract and like, yeah, I'm earning a good amount of money, but I don't enjoy it because I could yeah. just as easily go and get a job, but I don't enjoy it and take away a ton of the hassle of so having to manage all this stuff yourself. Um, and then also, I think there's definitely a part, at least recently, where the market kind of seems like it ebbs and flows. So there's times where, to your point, you get 12 people coming to you saying, hey, Rob, I need, a, I need an Android developer yeah. like today. And then you get no nothing for a while. Nothing. And the nothing is great when you're in a contract. And it's not great when you're not in a contract. So there's yeah. definitely this kind of like, yes, you want freedom and yes, you want autonomy, but you also want to figure out like if, if I'm not doing anything for the next three months, maybe I don't fancy working, but if I'm not doing anything and I know in three months time, I am definitely doing, I'm going on vacation or whatever it is. And I get approached for a gig today, like a couple of years ago, I would have said no. And then, you know, in a month's time, I'll be bored and I would have wish I would have took it and nobody's calling mm -hmm. me. Whereas now I might say yes because then that gives me a much, much more freedom on the back end because I can go on holiday yeah. and I can come back and, I, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's definitely, the, yeah, I think the most challenging part is finding, like picking stuff that you're going to enjoy um, and then also knowing like when to say yes, when to say no and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a fine line. It's, it can be difficult to navigate at the beginning. And like you said, you have to mm -hmm, yeah. experience it yourself and know what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Yeah, I think at the beginning, the number one thing, at least for me, it's just like people are afraid of numbers at you that you've never heard in your life. So it's like, yes, I'll yeah. do this. Yes, I'll do this. And then suddenly mm -hmm. when you realize it's normal and it's not like, oh, if you if you had said no, you missed this opportunity, like there's another one around the corner, then suddenly, yeah, you don't have to like to your point, you know, I didn't have to take on two contracts when I was early in the contracting game because that was just killing me for money that I didn't need, essentially. So, mm -hmm. no, yeah, there's definitely a fine line. Um, and I think there's something cool. to be said, too, with, you know, you said there's numbers being thrown at you. Yeah. You also, this is rare, but it does happen. And it happened to me uh, before. Yeah. I threw a number to a client and the client said, yeah, that's not going to work. And, I, and that's happened to me. And I said, hey, I understand, like, yeah. you know, these rates are kind of high. I mean, that's just the rate that I charge. And the, and the guy goes, no, 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 no. He's like, you don't understand. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, this is not high enough. Mm. And I'm like, what? Like it was like in a healthcare industry. Yeah. I'm like, yeah what yeah. do you mean high, not high enough? And he goes, you're like half of what everyone else is telling us. Like no one's going to take you seriously. And he was he's like, a right. and yeah. he goes, you want to be considered seriously. You need to come up by another 50%. And I never charged him. I was like, what? Yeah. And he goes, yeah, you come in another 50% higher. You're going to be considered like a good deal. I'm just mm -hmm. like, no way. And so those, yeah. those are very, very rare that they do happen. And it depends yeah. on the industry uh, that you're in, but they're mm -hmm. out there. So you got to be aware of yeah. kind of what to charge and, and where you're going. Yeah, yeah no, 100%. And I was also going to say to that point, there's also the instance where you go to a client, like I've I've gone to clients and I've offered like what I would consider a fairly low rate because for whatever yeah. reason, at that point in my life, it works out. And yeah. they're like, oh, that's too much. Um, oh, yeah, totally. And yeah, and there's a lot of people out there that would be like, oh, that's too much. I need to bring my price down. But you definitely need to know, like, what's your worth? What is the project worth? Because there's going to mm -hmm. be clients out there where you charge them 20% of what everyone else is saying, and they want to pay five. And if you don't know those numbers, you could end up doing mm -hmm. the job for five. And yeah, then it's just not, it's not great for you. So there's definitely yep. that aspect of it as well. Yeah. 